My name is Chester Chen. I am working for a company called Alba Data Labs. We organize the uh, uh, San Francisco uh, Data Analytics Meetup. Uh, so today we have two talks. Uh, you know, the first talk is by Bill, uh, and he's one of the co-founders for a company called Mini Trees, and they have done fantastic work on the related to GPUs, data processing GPUs, machine learning, uh, visualizations. So uh, about a month ago, I guess, I uh, invited over to give a talk at our company's tech talk. Uh, at the lunch time, we had this weekly tech talk, and it was, really <coughs> and it was I thought it was a fantastic, fantastic work and uh, a great presentation. So I, I so so I said to I got to share with a much bigger audience. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> so um, <coughs> Kale has a graduate from MIT, and uh, he has uh, before that he had done. Uh, Another, with another startup in the uh, uh, GPU machine, uh, machine learning and data processing. And he had worked with a Professor John Kenny uh, at UC Berkeley uh, on these uh, GPUs with, uh, with a library called <coughs> Lit1. So they have done a lot of work. So, so, uh, so let's welcome Kale. So you talk a matter. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Uh, like Chester said, uh, I'm Kale. I'm really happy to be with uh, you today. Uh, I'm sorry for the awkward setup of like putting my computer over here. I have to run some demos and things, but such is life. Um, so, and, and the talk uh, that I'm doing, I'm gonna focus mostly on the work I've been doing at uh, the company I co-founded, Many Trees. Um, and we've been developing a platform for GPU-enabled data processing, machine learning, and visualization. Um, so, I'll do a high level overview of how the technology has been designed and go into a little bit more detail of how, um, it's, been do, um, how it's been applied to a couple of specific use cases. Um, and then I'm gonna end with some more speculative visualization uh, projects uh, that we hope to incorporate in the future. Um, I thought first though, before I got into it, I would, oh, is this, this is better. I would um, give a little bit of background on myself, where I came from and how I got here and how I got excited about GPUs to begin with. Um, I, I studied computer science and math and art actually in undergrad at, at Madison. Um, and I really, I couldn't decide what I liked more if I liked programming or art making. Um, and that was always a constant struggle in undergrad. Um, after, after undergrad, I went and got my MFA in computing in the arts actually at UC San Diego, which is one of the few programs where you can do such a weird thing. Um, and I'm gonna take a little detour into a project that was really the first project that got me excited about data mining. Um, and it was, yeah, where I first became interested in exploring pattern and structure in data, the data set being playthroughs of different video games. Um, so I grew up in love with video games. I think that's a stereotype, but that's, that's who I am. Um, and the first Super Mario Brothers, this is a breakdown of every single level in the game. Um, Super Mario Brothers was the first time I felt like there was a living, breathing, intelligent world beyond the screen. And I was just endlessly fascinated with it. Um, and I, so I returned to this fascination um, in my MFA program to really think about how can I explore this? How can I do something with it? And I decided to modify the Super Nintendo emulator to map out the space of play. Um, I'll show a video. Uh, to record every single playthrough. Oh, you can kind of hear it. Um, this is a, me playing Gradius 3 uh, about 212 times, all projected into the same contiguous space. Um, and so it starts off, it's extremely excruciatingly loud if, if you have the volume set, right? Um, but it just, oh. sorry, I'll turn it down. Um, yeah, it, it was super exciting, super fun to make. Uh, this is from Mega Man 7, another favorite game. Um, but there was something really magical about compressing this like entire breadth of play into this one kind of singular visualization. Um, and I saw it as a really compelling way of exploring the underlying logic and the relationship with the player and the, and the machine. I'll show one more. 
This has become a feature in a lot of uh, newer games, but I, I was doing this 10 years ago, I swear. <laughs> this is Street Fighter II, another classic. And so I'm showing this mostly because this was the spark that really got me into data science, believe it or not. So I started doing these, um, a number of visualization projects, mapping projects, and data analytics projects kind of around the same time in arts program, but I really didn't have a formal education in the analytics side. Um, and so that brought me to uh, MIT, where this time last year I was finishing um, as a grad student in engineering systems and urban studies and planning, actually a joint program. And I was doing computational social science work. Um, and I was also a researcher at the Sensible City Lab, where we were um, trying to understand human behavior at an urban scale through big data. So this is everything from looking at anonymized uh, mobile phones to looking at taxi trips. We'll look at a lot more taxi trips in this presentation to uh, credit card transactions and exploring how one can infer mobility patterns from how uh, people spend their money, basically. Um, and this slide is actually an image from the first time I started to use uh, GPUs for visualization projects. Um, I had been doing all of my data wrangling, heavy spatial operations on really massive data sets, so like call detail records for an entire country over a six month span of time, and I would be waiting a week to kind of reduce that down to a set of users I could explore um, uh, for, to, to understand these kind of mobility behaviors. But I was, um, I found very quickly that I could kind of compress and express some of the results um, in these kind of GPU-enabled web uh, visualizations. Yeah? Can you give a size of the data you're working with? So that easy for us? Sure, sure. So a day's worth of records for like call detail records is about five gigs. Um, yeah. Um, I will show more specific examples as well um, later on, but this is all just kind of building up to this when I got involved with many trees, um, which happened kind of the end of last year, uh, we got together, uh, me and two other co-founders had this shared appreciation and excitement for um, GPUs and high performance analytics using GPUs. So that's all the, the background. I, I'm kind of, I'm more from the data science visualization side, machine learning side. Um, my other co-founder, Steve Stewart, is um, highly trained in the more database world. Um, and we kind of brought all these things together, put it under one roof to create this unified platform uh, for everything I said before, data processing, machine learning, and visualization. Um, designed uh, to deliver the magnitude, uh, orders of magnitude, speed ups and cost efficiencies um, for workloads at the limits of traditional CPU bound solutions. Um, so when we were putting this all together, um, we, we were meeting with a lot of people in industry and trying to understand the current limits uh, of ML at scale. And we kept hearing the same things, that CPUs are too expensive. Um, this kind of prototyping, moving through the data science workflow is very slow. It's hard to productize sophisticated analytics. It's hard to move from that prototyping environment into production. and. You know, uh, some specific examples of this, um, we did a proof of concept with a cybersecurity firm. I can't say their name, but <clears throat> they needed immediate results. Uh, they needed faster duration times. They wanted to move through that data science workflow much more quickly, quickly to really explore and exhaust the hyperparameter space of these, these big algorithms. Um, and as they told us, their competitive advantage was in um, analytical sophistication over runtime, and they needed to dramatically reduce their runtime. So along the other dimension, um, we were talking to people like some uh, director of infrastructure at Walmart who was saying they, they had to reduce their energy bill. Um, they, they got to a point where they could not throw any more nodes at a problem. The marginal improvement in computational speed um, was completely outweighed by the cost of introducing a new node to the system. And so it was from this we be began to flesh out this idea for our full um, ML platform, GPU-enabled ML platform. 
Um, and so, yeah, these thoughts in inform the design. I'm gonna go through this kind of stylized overview of what we're building and then kind of break it down into the constituent pieces and then show some examples of that. So we viewed it as this kind of standalone GPU framework with connections to the big data stack, Apache big data stack, um, starting with GPUs at the bottom, focusing on local clusters for security and performance, scaling to hosted um, cloud solutions, so like AWS and SoftLayer, um, being able to run everything from like your local device all the way out to, yeah, Amazon EC2. The processing engine um, supported GPU in-memory SQL um, querying and simple analytics uh, that would fuel this fast um, feature engineering for iterative um, update machine learning. Um, and then it would also produce um, some really cool visualization primitives that I'll show later. So like developing super fast heat maps, super fast point maps, and things like that. Um, and then it was also um, kind of running this cluster compute framework for syncing up multiple uh, clustered GPU setups. On top of that, we're building into and around um, BidMock and BidMat. So this was um, open source uh, machine learning algorithms that were developed by John Canney at Berkeley. And so I should mention too that John Canney is our advisor. It's a super cool um, open source framework that everybody interested in big data analytics should get into and explore. Um, BidMock? Yeah. I'll show some benchmarks from that and do a brief uh, overview. And then, you know, finally at the top, the interface level, um, building these data scientist analyst interfaces uh, that were uh, powered by GPU data visualization uh, pieces. Um, so this includes everything from the low level API access um, through, uh, you know, like IPython notebooks, all the way to mission control dashboards. All right, so now to take a step back and talk about why GPUs, why, why do this at all. Uh, GPUs are super important for the high memory bandwidth and parallelism. Um, they've always been good. They've been designed to be good at really a dense matrix arithmetic, um, matrix multiplies. And over the last few years, they've really started to pull away um, from CPU performance in terms of sparse data as well. Uh, so text and web data, all sorts of data sets out there that you use every day are, are sparse. Uh, and this is mostly due to the super fast memory they've acquired. And they're just now significantly outperforming CPUs on sparse. Um, they are also really great for machine learning, it uh, turns out. Um, and I think a lot of people are aware of this from the rise in deep learning, but um, there's a really great sense of algorithm alignment uh, with GPUs. Um, you know, one of the big trends over the last few years has been towards these mini-batch optimization uh, techniques. Uh, stochastic gradient descent has become the dominant way of working with big data, and it's really compatible with GPUs. Um, you can now park these very non-trivial models directly in GPU memory and kind of farm out these mini, batch, mini batches of data to update. Um, and it works very uh, quickly and efficiently. Um, okay, so performance hit, customizability. Um, one of, yeah, so the design goals on the customi customizability front, there is great value in treating your machine learning algorithms as not just black boxes. Um, being able to get in and change your loss functions, being able to add secondary performance criteria. So, um, you know, you may want to maximize revenue first, but you, uh, there are all, often um, all sorts of other secondary um, constraints you want to add later. Um, and then on the database side, on the data processing engine database side, um, there, we felt it was very important for people to be able to customize their own um, database model. So by default, out of the box, our platform runs in a row store uh, database, but you can, uh, you can modify it to, uh, it runs on a column store, sorry. You can modify it to make a document store, a row store, whatever you'd like. And then, again, this really fast movement from exploration into production. Being able to run the same code um, in your prototyping environment, your local machine, right on your GPU, 
all the way out to um, clusters. All right, all of this is of course in the service of creating this um, better data science workflow. And so I think this is kind of a graph that anyone who comes to a big data meetup is familiar with. But you know, the, the thinking behind all this is that there is this really big value in exploratory data mining um, and creating a hypothesis in the form of the model, seeing if the structure you're hypothesizing is really there and moving around that circle as, as rapidly as you can to create more value. Um, and so having this, having this unified GPU platform really minimizes the bottlenecks to, um, to move through this quickly um, and get the data scientists to the places that can't really be automated, that require the kind of human subjectivity um, to make good models. Um, so the feature engineering, the, the customization and tuning, um, and the, the, the interpretation at the end. And then finally, recognizing again, as I mentioned, the prototyping problem. Um, typically, I think today, most models done in, in a prototyping environments are, are done in prototyping languages like Python, Scikit-Learn, and R, and they're not suitable to be translated directly into a production environment, so there's a huge refactoring of code, um, and this is not good for ML. Uh, it's often done by an engineering team that has little experience in these things. There, it's done in a different environment, shortcuts are taken, and there's usually a loss in performance in, in the result. So there's this tremendous value in closing that gap and being able to move immediately from your kind of testing, exploratory environment right into your production environment. Okay, so now I'm gonna go through that stack and kind of break into a little bit more detail of some of the, the way we've designed things. Um, and the first thing I'm going to talk about is Aspen Core, or Aspen SQL. So we have this tree metaphor thing going on, as you may have noticed. This is, um, this is the, the, the data processing layer, the, the core compute engine. Um, and it's kind of analogous to Spark Core and Spark SQL. And again, I have to give credit to Steve Stewart, uh, the other technical co-founder on this project. He has really designed and implemented most of this. Um, to go through a few of the details here, um, it's all based on the leaf data abstraction, which is a fine-grained uh, mutable data abstraction, unlike, a, unlike Spark's RDD. So that means you know, it's, not, it's not really resilient from the Spark perspective, but it's resilient to, uh, from the perspective of ML. Um, it removes the overhead of storing, of replicating your data, and you can move much more quickly. Um, at its heart, it's a key value store, but again, you can force whatever scheme, schema you want on top to make a row store, a document store, what have you. And then within this data processing engine are a collection of uh, roof-lined OpenCL and CUDA kernels for the relational algebra primitives. And you can combine these primitives to form any kind of uh, relational algebra expression you want for the query. Um, I guess I should, I should mention too this principle of roofline design. This is something that, that John Canny taught us as well, but it's really just a, as simple as understanding the theoretical limits of your hardware and designing right to those limits uh, if you can. And so we followed that as closely as we could. Um, the database built on top is Aspen SQL. Like I said, it's a row store. It's all written in Java.
And so this is like some 3D uh, web visualization stuff I actually started as a grad student. Um, again, when I was participating in this big data challenge with taxi trips, yes, I'm obsessed with taxi trips. Um, I'm going to show a video. It's not too loud. This was all built in WebGL. Um, so you're seeing, let's see, I think this is, uh, it's five to 10 gigs of data, these taxi trips, um, for a number of months. This is the point map showing um, pickups in teal, drop offs in pink. There's a difference map. Difference map has music behind it. So it's taxi supply uh, averaged over a block and taxi demand averaged over a block. This is a directional mesh, um, just showing the sum of trips in lines over the, the city, origins in teal, destinations in pink. And then the last one, if it ever goes to it, is a neighborhood connections map, which is just summing the trips per neighborhood and looking at how connected these neighborhoods are by, by these uh, trip instances. Okay, so let me explain a little bit on how that's done. All the data in these examples is uh, pre-canned, so this is offline pre-processing step where the intensity values like the point maps, the heat maps are encoded in images. Um, they're all generated just in Python. Uh, actually, let me, s so these are three different time slices over the city, early morning, midday, and rush hour. Uh, this is three different time slices of the directional mesh over the city. And then on the client side, in the web application, you have this kind of 3D space with the map object at the center. It's kind of blanketed with these particles, and the shader code is actually uh, deforming the, the particle, the size, the intensity of color, uh, position, um, by that intensity value in the, the texture. And so that's how you're getting to um, some of these images here. And so again, I think, you know, these are, this is, it allows us to um, encode and represent a huge deal of data in kind of a real-time visualization environment. But again, the big limitation here is that this pre-processing step, um, so it really prevents a user from having a fine-grained control over the time slice or any other kind of data filtering uh, operations you'd want to do. One of the things that we've been working on lately is bringing this, um, connecting this kind of visualization um, at a bigger scale on a globe <laughs> with um, this data engine that can produce these uh, image encodings uh, on the fly in real time. And so I'll just show one more video of that working. And so these are, is this playing? Yeah. Um, these allow for these really high resolution um, maps that are generated on the Cades to, to show up on, um, in 3D forms on the client side and being reprojected into yeah, these, these complex kind of landscapes of other data. And now, um, because it's all being generated in real time, one of the things you can do is you can zoom in and have the, the texture map update um, to your zoom level and see a level of detail that you couldn't before. All right, um, and with that, I guess I'm just going to end, and I can take questions now. I hope some of that presented an exciting view of using GPUs. <laughs> yeah. Were you bottlenecked more by PCIe slots, power draw, or like GPU? How much money were you going to spend? Yeah, let's speak for your repeated questions. Oh yeah, say it again. Were you actually. Bottlenecked? You, you repeat a question. Yeah, no, no. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, can you say it to me? The bottlenecked by... By your number of uh, like card slots. Card slots. Power draw or the power cost draw. of your GPUs. Or the cost of the GPUs. What was your bottleneck? Um, I th the bottleneck... Hmm. So the biggest bottleneck is, is communication across machines and GPUs. Like if, if they're all in the same slot, um, there's, there's not much trouble there. It's really this allocation barrier, I'd say. So like when you, have, when you start up the system, you have to load all that memory, and that takes time. That really does take a while. So um, massive data sets, um, filling the cards with all that data is kind of a pain in the ass, yeah. Yes, yeah, so have we considered looking into FPGAs? We talked about it at some point briefly, and I think we would consider it if we had access. Um, GPUs have, are so easy to come by right now, and they're pretty cheap. And, you know, again, my, like, laptop, this is like a two-year-old laptop with an NVIDIA card that I can run pretty fast models on as it stands, so it's been good enough. And the, the improvement already over CPU has, has really made us want to go further with that. But yeah, I think we would definitely consider any kind of heterogeneous compute environment, whether it's FPGAs, GPUs, combination of CPUs, you know, whatever. It's around what? Yeah, so I, that's, it's interesting. I can't pretend to be an expert on FPGAs and actually on the hardware side either. Um, so yeah, I, I, I really, you know, I'm not the guy on the team who's, who's able to speak to that as much, but yeah, that's interesting. I'll look into it. Yeah. Yep. So, is mapping a very good feature to something? No, so like actually, if you do your hashing right, you, you lose very little of the signal. I mean, so a lot of, you, we're talking, these are incredibly, incredibly sparse features and, and you get to a point where if you're minimizing your collisions well, and so that the folding scheme is not a good feature hash. It, it's, it, it has a uniform output distribution, which is something you want, but you don't have the sort of avalanche effect you want from a good feature hash, which is you want a, a small change in the input to result in a, a big change in uh, output. Because um, you want to decouple the feature frequency from um, like where, uh, where it's positioned in the output in some way. Um, but we found that when we did when we tried a good feature hash, it didn't really make that much of a difference in this case. I mean, yeah, the features were just so sparse that at a certain point we're kind of, you know, a whole bunch of them are sharing one feature and it didn't really change the outcome all that much. Um, and so, you know, yeah, one of the big problems with feature hashing is these features lose their meaning at a certain point. But when you're dealing with 266 million, the meaning to begin with is questionable. Um, and then we also got around a lot of that by using the, the first 5,000 as a dense set, which was explaining a really good deal of variation uh, in the model already, I'd say. Yep. The slide where you, uh, you were comparing the Aspen versus uh, the Spark sequence? Yes, yes. Well, what was your uh, GPU uh, cluster configuration versus? So that? that was one single GPU. It was a Tesla K80. Um, and how much was the data? Uh, the data, I'd have to look again. Um, it was all in memory. Um, huh? You billion records? Yeah, yeah. Uh, on one GPU. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a, it's a big GPU, though. So I think it's 12 gigs uh, on the GPU. No, it's two 12 gig GPUs, 24 gigs. We could fit everything in memory and, and do that. So yeah, that is one caveat of the processing engine. 
um, benchmark is everything was sitting in GPU. We weren't cycling things intelligently. We we're imagining, okay, we have loaded all the data. It's all sitting out here. Um, let's run the, the select query. That was comparing, comparing to the Spark SQL how many machines were in there? Um, let me look, actually. Uh, that's that's their, uh, the benchmark they publicized. It's on their website. We followed it exactly. Um, yeah, I'd, I'll click through because <laughs> um, I did list it on there, I think. But um, <coughs> da, 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 da. five instance, forty core, uh, EC two. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Very much. All right. Thank you. <laughs>